So this presentation on Otis Marston, the cute little kid there in this giant, giant collection that he made. What button do I push? Is it the one in the back? Is it this one in the front? On the bottom, all right. Well, so there's gonna be a bunch of people that are gonna talk up here about giant things. I, Marston, I could take days and days. His collection, I could take days and days. I'm gonna talk about three rabbit holes. Because you historians know as you're researching something, you fall down rabbit holes. And I have learned to bring a headlamp and turn it on and look around because it's always a oh, wow. It wasn't that button. Wasn't that? Thank you. It's the right one. So uh, you start with you start with box one, folder one to twenty-seven. But with Marston, you don't stop there. There's a quarter million pieces of paper in this collection. What's in there? Well, this is the first rabbit hole I fell down. This is the Huntington Reading Room when Marston went there in 1947. He was trying to look at maps before John Wesley Powell. And while he was there, he met this guy, Leslie Bliss, the head librarian of the Huntington. And Bliss was interested in what Marston was doing and went to Berkeley to visit with the Marstons. And that's where Otis Marston told Leslie Bliss he was terrified of fire. Because Marston had lived through the 23 Berkeley fire and now he had these original manuscripts from river trips and he didn't want them lost to fire. And Bliss didn't, didn't, didn't miss a beat. He said, Mr. Marston, I'm going to give to you access to our photostat machine. And we'll make copies of whatever you want. And Marston right away overran Bliss with requests for photocopy. And Bliss turned Marston over to the women of the Huntington. I can't tell you how hard it is to find photographs of the women of the Huntington. These women are behind the scenes. You never hear about them. Gertrude Runka, Virginia Rust, Heidi Noya on the right, and Emily Hewitt, which we can still not find a photograph of. These women taught Otis Marston library science. They said, Mr. Marston, they are always so polite. This is what, how we want you to set up your collection. And he did. And they said, Mr. Marston, we are going to send you green boxes and blue folders. And he wanted them by the car load. And they said, they're, they're out of stock now. You've got to wait a minute. He said, I need them. Send me more. And when these little silver fish showed up in his basement full of green boxes and blue folders, the Huntington women said, relax. Here's a little chemical. You'll be fine. And, and it was. And when he wrote them and said, what about a very fax copy machine in 1953, they said, buy it. And he did. Also in 1953, he put a paragraph that they had written for him in his will that the collection he was amassing was going to them. So when you go to the Huntington today, the first rabbit hole take home le lesson is this collection of Otis Marston with a quarter million pe pieces of stuff in it is a cooperative effort between the Huntington Library and Otis Marston. It's a very rare collection that way. Here's the next rabbit hole I fell into. The guy in the white t-shirt is Norm Nevels, and the guy on the right, without a shirt, is a fellow named Neil Wilson. Neil was an advertising executive in San Francisco. They are finishing up the San Juan River trip, and on that trip, Norm was complaining because he couldn't sell seats for his Grand Canyon River trips. Neil Wilson, the advertising guy, said, this is easy. Will you give me a 50% discount to your Grand Canyon River trip this summer? I'll bring children. And we will show the world with children how safe it is to run Grand Canyon. And that's exactly what they did. They're the kids. Neil brought his son, Bruce. It's 
still alive, great guy. Had his 13th birthday at Phantom Ranch, the superintendent came down. Garth Marston, 16 year old's in the back. They already knew each other. Neil thought ahead when he talked to Norm and said, I'll bring Otis Marston and his son because we already do ski trips with them. So there are four men on a log. <laughs> this is a James White. Uh, that log is not going anywhere fast. So did he or do it, he do it, not do it James White, I don't know. But when you have kids on the river, you put them to work, you give them a boat, one navigates, the other one tries to row, just like today. <laughs> and when you got kids down there, you put them to work in the kitchen. <laughs> just like today. Hey, it's river running. This is easy, right? Yeah. Marston never looked back. Marston got it. He got the take home message. His next trip with Nevels, he brought his twin daughters and a friend of theirs from school. And Norm brought his daughter, Joan. And then they did Cataract Canyon. Norm wasn't willing to bring Joan, but Otis Marston was willing to bring his twin daughters, his wife, and a 16 year old girl who knew no one on the trip. Cataract, 1945. Wow. They didn't stop there, they ran Hell's Canyon, same circles, same story, same deal here in Lador, 1947. Otis Marston kept Norm Nevels afloat through the war and kept him in kids and in river trips. I didn't know that's rabbit hole number two. Rabbit hole number three was pretty weird. I fell in there, turned on my headlamp, looked around and went, this is 1950, there's a helicopter, there's two motorboats, now that's the Esmeralda II on the left and the Chris Craft on the right, that helicopter must have come from Phoenix or something. Well, nah, I was wrong, again. Bill Belknap met Otis Marston in 1947. They became friends. Marston invited Belknap to come on that 1950 river trip and Belknap being the reporter, photographer said, Otis, if I could get a helicopter with rapid and boats, I could sell that. <clears throat> And there's a guy that's setting up helicopters at the South Rim. Otis said, I'll talk to him. We'll, we'll make it happen. There's the helicopter. They're setting up for the money shot. There's Belknap in the bottom with the camera. Here comes the wind blast. Look out. <laughs> this is a little Bell helicopter. And the money shot is pretty simple. Just reach for the empty can of gas. That's the money shot. Take the picture now, get out of here. It's all windy and I can't hear a thing. Go away. <laughs> and two years later, the Park Service will put in regulations to stop any type of canyon or mountain resupply without superintendent permission. The park saw this in the in the, in the Life magazine in July. And they said, now we can't wait, wait. Did, you, did you authorize that? No, I didn't know that was happening. We'll stop it. And they did. I was like, wait a minute, what is this all about? So in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. at College Park, I learned about this guy, Ed Montgomery. Montgomery got into helicopters early, 1945. In 1946, he put on a Santa Claus suit and with his pilot dressed as an elf, they went to, San, uh, went to Salt Lake City, they landed in the street, there were thousands of people there, and on the way back, in December 46, flying back to Tucson, they took their helicopter into Western Grand Canyon, and a little light bulb went off in Ed Montgomery's head, oh my, if I brought these helicopters into Grand Canyon, maybe I could make some money there. So he started sending these letters to Superintendent Bryant saying, hey, I want to do this and that with helicopter. And Bryant kept saying, no, no, and no. And then the Episcopal Church wanted to build a church in Supai. They were going to use a Quonset hut. They took it all apart. And Montgomery's Arizona Helicopter Service, 24 flights took the Quonset hut down to Supai. He kept writing Bryant, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna. And Bryant kept saying, this crafter are dangerous? That's uh, Arizona helicopters, you know. Craft there, that was one of the ones that made it. Some others got destroyed. No. And Montgomery then took matters into his own hands 
And in June of 1950, he set up shop at the Tucson Motor Camp and started flying out of there with tourists. Meanwhile, on the river, remember our river runners? Remember Otis Marston and the Esmeralda? It broke down. Its motor has failed here. And there's Ed Hudson abandoning the boat. And what they're going to do, they have two boats. So Otis Marston's going to go out and hike up to Supai and get Montgomery to come rescue Ed Hudson and his son. And that boat headbutts the schist. Boom. It's a strong boat and keeps right on going. So they're going to rest. They're going to leave Hudson and his son at SOS Beach. And they're going to run out and save them. But what happens is Otis's wife is up on the rim. And she's like, something's wrong down there. She goes out to Tucson, gets in a helicopter with Red Carson, and goes and looks for the river runner. She sees the Esmeralda is empty, floating in the river. And she finds her hubby down at Tapeats Creek fishing, because he loved to fish. <laughs> and there they are with the little, the little hiller. There you go. And they're going to have to fly away and go rescue the Hudsons. This is great. Now, Doc doesn't have to hike up soup to get the phone. This is a, a Hiller 360. Ed Montgomery had two helicopters. He had the Bell and the Hiller. The Hiller's nickname was the Hiller Killer. <laughs> and this helicopter is going to crash later that day. Fortunately, Mar uh, Margaret won't be in it, but Red will. And off they go, and they see Ed Hudson on SOS Beach, and they wave, and he waves, and they come back with the two helicopters to rescue the two guys. Now, Ed Carson is smart. He brings some beer. <laughs> and and, uh, and, and uh, Hudson is really happy, and he's going to need that beer because he's about ready to crash. <laughs> so they take off. There's a the little hiller. Now remember, Ed Montgomery's right there as well with the, with the red bell. There it is down there. So he's going to follow the hiller. He's taken off down there. And then, uh-oh. The hillers had a way of just motor failure. And they would crash. And so this helicopter's destroyed. destroyed. The good thing is Hudson's a little shell-shocked, but he's still alive. Um, the next day, the press has a field day with this. They go nuts. It's all about Hudson and losing his boat and his rescue. Meanwhile, just like nothing happened, Otis Marston and the Chris Craft finish the rest of the trip. They get no press. <laughs> Nobody knows. This is a Chris Craft stock racing runabout in Lava Falls. Ho-hum. <laughs> this stuff was old hat by then. Belknap was like, I need a helicopter. And he was right. They got down to Lake Mead. There's Fran Belknap in the back there. How cool is that? And, and that, was that, that was the trip. A month later, along comes Jim Rigg and Frank Wright, and they find the Esmeralda II. Remember that boat was abandoned? They find it on the rocks here at Forrester Rapid. It has dry docked itself, and they get it to start. One of the guys on the trip moves transformers for a living, big heavy things. He wanders off. He brings back logs. He says, now everybody pull. And they move it down to the river. Frank Wright is a brilliant mechanic. He fixes the motor. And they drive the thing out of the canyon. <laughs> they start a big legal battle. The boat ends up here. But look, on that boat right there, that woman right there, that, that little girl, she's still alive. She's in Indiana. What a wonderful woman. I don't know. It's just great, this history stuff, falling in these rabbit holes. What about Montgomery? Superintendent Bryant wrote the Civil Aviation Authority and said this guy buzzes the flagpoles at Bright Angel and he hovers his helicopter in front of the Yavapai Observation Station when the rangers are giving their ranger talks. Can you do something about this? Okay, and he, I got to hold it closer, but I can't hold it too close. And the Civil Aviation Authority comes and talks to Ed Montgomery, and he becomes more civil to his credit. He stops doing these obnoxious flights because he's making money, big money. This is new for Ed Montgomery. He's actually doing really well. He takes over the little gas station there. He starts, his wife starts flipping hamburgers. 
and Red Carson is doing flight after flight after flight, and things are looking really good. Not only that, but begrudgingly, the superintendent continues slowly and steadily to give Montgomery permission to rescue sick hikers down in the canyon, and river runners too. But, and you know there's a but in this story. Montgomery's making a flight down by Phantom Ranch in the hiller, and the motor quits. These hillers, and so he does a hard landing at the mouth of Pipe Creek, and the tourists that are flying, they hike up to the rim, and the mechanics come in, and they fix the helicopter, and he gets back in, and he starts flying away again, and just within 15 seconds of the flight, the motor quits again, and he lands in the river. And they, fortunately, the river's not very deep, and they were able to get out without drowning. And they used the mules to pull the helicopter out and start taking it apart and get it up to the rim. And here's where Montgomery made his fatal mistake. He did not notify the Civil Aviation Authority that he had crashed twice. Every crash, every motor failure needed to be reported. The CAA came in, did their own investigation, and shut him down. Fall into rabbit holes. Tell us what you find. This is an amazing collection, and I think we will be mining it for a long, long time in the future. Thank you very much.